Three common critical lung problems are pulmonary embolism, often called PE, pneumothorax, which may be referred to as a PN, and acid-base imbalance. PEs occur as a result of a clot or object that takes place in the circulation and travels into the pulmonary vessels. Pneumothorax, hemothorax, or pleural effusions occur when air, fluid, blood, or pus enters the pleural space, interrupting negative pressure around the lungs. Review the ABG scenarios for the class because they will come up while discussing these disorders. A thrombus is a stationary blood clot. A thrombosis is the forming of the clot. These two words are used interchangeably to describe blood clots that form and cling to the inner walls of the blood vessels. An embolism is the formation of a chunk of debris that travels from one place and takes up residence inside a blood vessel. That chunk of debris is almost always blood clot or a, cl or a series of clots. <laughs> An embolus is the debris that is already sitting in the vessel. Again, both terms are used interchangeably. The classic example of an embolism occurs when clots form in the deep veins of the calves and travel into the tiny capillaries of the lungs. This is called a pulmonary embolism. One statistic states that 25% of hospital deaths are due to pulmonary embolism. The most typical cause of pathological blood clot formation occurs from stasis. Stasis is a state of stillness or a lack of movement. When people don't move, blood cannot get returned to the heart. The blood will pool in dependent areas that would usually be lower extremities that are farthest away from the heart. On long plane rides, it is essential to keep the feet moving. Patients who lie in bed must also keep their feet and legs moving. A deep vein thrombosis, a DVT, occurs when clots form in the deep veins. Usually the clots will form in the veins of the calves or maybe the thighs. Sometimes clots will form in the deep veins of the abdomen. When these clots form, the inflammatory response will kick in. The clotted area will have all the classic looks of an inflammation. Virchow's triad is a combination of risk factors for clot formation. It includes 1. Venous stasis or blood pooling due to lack of muscle movement. 2. Hypercoagulability or an increased tendency for blood to clot. And 3. Injury to the vessel wall. Stasis is the most common etiological factor. Stasis occurs with immobility. Immobility is highly typical in hospitalized patients. The less muscle movement that occurs in the patient, the higher the risk of clotting. Patients at great risk for hypercoagulability include those with cancer, those who are obese, and even pregnant women. Certain conditions lead to an increased tendency for clotting due to an increase in platelets or clotting factors. Trauma or surgery to vessels causes a rough interior lining that catches blood. A classic example of endothelial injury occurs with a total knee or hip replacement. All knee and hip surgery patients require DVT prevention or prophylaxis during the post-op period. Signs and symptoms of deep vein thrombosis are warmth, edema, and a cramping feeling at the side of the clot. In the past, Homan sign was included as well, but that has generally fallen out of favor. A few lab tests may help determine if there is a clot. D-dimer in particular is a byproduct of blood clot breakdown. An increased D-dimer rules in for the possibility of a clot, so if the D-dimer value is high, there is a higher probability that clot formation is in progress. Having high levels of the clot dissolving substance, D-dimer, in your blood may suggest an increased likelihood of blood clots although D-dimer levels may also be elevated by other factors, including recent surgery. When patients exhibit signs and symptoms of clot formation, imaging can help. The patient will go to the radiology department for a Doppler ultrasound of the affected area. And in some cases, even an MRI or CT scan can be done to take a much closer look at the affected area. A pulmonary embolism, PE, 
happens when a blood clot travels through the pulmonary artery and lodges somewhere in the vasculature of the lungs. The pulmonary artery carries blood from the right ventricle to the lungs, and the pulmonary vein carries blood from the lungs to the left atrium. Generally, systemic blood clots returning to the right atrium will lodge in the pulmonary capillaries first. While clots can also travel to the heart or the brain, these clots would usually originate in the heart itself, seen frequently with atrial fibrillation. Immobility is the number one reason for PE. Any component of Virchow's triad can lead to PE development, but it is most common with patients who are static in movement. The use of SCDs can prevent deep vein thrombosis or clot formation. All post-op patients who have had surgery on the abdomen or lower extremities are expected to be lying still for a day or more and will need some type of compression device in place to deliver blood back to the heart. You will see a few different types of compression devices. You might see Velcro wraps that just go around the feet, foot pumps, or you might see sleeves that only go to the calves. Graduated compression devices with the trade name of TEDS which are thromboembolic deterrent, might also be used for prevention of DVTs. TEDs go on like pantyhose. They are very tight around the feet and ankles and gradually loosen as they move up the leg. Studies are being done on the effectiveness of TEDs. Clinical manifestations of pulmonary embolism are shortness of breath, SOB, chest pain, and hemoptysis, which is coughing up blood. The patient will exhibit signs and symptoms of impending doom telling you that something is wrong, but they don't know what it could be. The arterial blood gas, ABG, will often show respiratory alkalosis since typically the patient with the PE will be hyperventilating in order to compensate for the poor oxygen travel. The oxygen is traveling poorly because blood cannot get through the pulmonary vasculature to the left side of the heart to be delivered to the entire body. The vitals will show tachypnea, tachycardia, hypoxia with a low O2 sat, and a mild fever. PE can be diagnosed by a spiral CT or VQ scan. A PE is most frequently diagnosed by a spiral CT scan, but other tests might be used. A VQ scan might be conducted in the nuclear medicine department to compare ventilation with perfusion. In a PE, ventilation is normal since there is nothing really wrong with the airway. Perfusion, however, is poor. A positive result from the VQ, which is a ventilation perfusion scan, means that the ventilation normals... A positive result from a VQ, ventilation perfusion scan, means that the ventilation values are normal, but perfusion values are poor. The patient breathes normally but doesn't circulate blood adequately through the pulmonary field. The test is performed by having the patient breathe radioactive isotopes. Isotopes are injected and circulation is watched. A spiral CT is faster and has a higher resolution, allowing the radiologist to view perfusion in the lungs by looking across all tissue planes for clots. In a spiral or helical CT scan, the scanner rotates around your body in a spiral, like the stripe on a candy cane, to create three-dimensional images. This type of CT can detect abnormalities with much greater precision, and it's also much faster than a conventional CT scan. Dorothy, our poor troubled patient, endures one medical mishap after another. The nursing staff failed to put on her foot pumps or get her out of bed. For some unknown reason, nobody notices that DVT prevention medication was never ordered either. What's next? Signs and symptoms of a PE. The very best thing you can do to prevent thrombosis in the lower extremities is by promoting early ambulation. Early ambulation is best followed by SCDs and medications. Typically, a patient with any risk for DVT will receive anticoagulation therapy. Heparin and enoxaparin are very common. Enoxaparin, or Lovenox, is a prepackaged syringe. Don't expel the air prior to injection. After completing the injection, which includes injecting the bubble, 
A sharp safety shield is activated by pressing the plunger until it clicks into place. Patients may be trained to inject this drug into themselves after discharge, or they may even do it in the hospital. It must be injected into the abdomen, and you need to alternate sites on the abdomen. Alternatives to anoxaparin are heparin injections, or even PO aspirin, which is usually enteric coated. What do you do for a patient suspected of having a PE? Notify the healthcare provider, apply oxygen, get diagnostic tests, draw a coags panel, and start anticoagulants. Which of the above require getting an order first? You can expect these orders for the patient, Dorothy, who has just had a spiral CT which showed a large pulmonary embolism. First, oxygen, titrated to a saturation of at least 95%. Second, you will probably start the patient on a heparin protocol. This protocol consists of drawing a coagulation panel, giving heparin by intravenous push, usually 5,000 units, and then starting a continuous heparin drip. These measures will prevent the clot from enlarging and will allow the immune system to work on dissolving the clot. For less severe clots, inoxaparin injections may be ordered instead of IV heparin. Frequent coagulation panels will be drawn to make sure that the heparin is working and that the clotting time is where it should be. The typical goal of heparin therapy is to keep the PTT between 45 and 70 seconds. Note, at Kaiser facilities, an anti-XA is drawn for heparin drip monitoring, which is considered to be more accurate than clotting times, the PTT. At all facilities, a heparin drip is a high alert medication. High alert meds require two RNs to confirm orders and dose, as well as dose adjustments. While your patient is receiving heparin, warfarin pills will also be started. The heparin or anoxaparin must be continued until the pro-time, INR, reaches a therapeutic level. And since it takes about five days for Coumadin or warfarin to start working, the patient will need to be hooked up to a heparin drip or get anoxaparin, Lovenox, shots in the interim. The normal person would have an INR or international normalized ratio of 1. You want your patient with a clot to have an INR of about 2 to be considered therapeutic. That means it takes blood twice as long to clot. According to Kaiser's anticoagulation protocol, the heparin drip will be decreased when the anti-XA factor is too high and the drip will be increased when it's too low. The goal is to prevent further clot formation without causing excessive bleeding. When your patient is on a heparin drip, frequent monitoring is required and will likely be part of the protocol orders. A pneumothorax occurs when air is allowed to enter into the space between the visceral and parietal layers that surround the lungs. When air enters, negative pressure is lost and the lungs lose their round shape. Gas exchange is impaired. The worst case scenario occurs when air enters the space and cannot escape. In this case, the lung is squeezed by the air buildup, and this is called a tension pneumothorax. A hemothorax is like a pneumothorax, except it's blood now that enters the space instead of air. A pleural effusion occurs when serosanguineous fluid escapes into the pleural space as a result of surgery or cancer. An empyema occurs when pus drains into the pleural space. So why does a pneumothorax happen? A loss of negative pressure can occur for several reasons. It can be spontaneous. Every now and then a patient will appear in the emergency room with a pneumothorax for no apparent reason. Some people just have weak areas in the layers that surround the lungs. Patients with COPD are prone to weakness in the lung tissue integrity. After surgery, surgery in the chest will always cause cuts in the parietal layer, leading to the entry of blood and air into the pleural space. Iatrogenic? means the problem happened as a result of treatment by medical people. The most common iatrogenic cause is from the insertion of a central venous catheter, and of course trauma, as in a gunshot or stab wound, which will rip through the layers around the lungs, causing entry of air, fluid, or blood. Meet 64-year-old Bob Booser. He was admitted with ascites from a long-standing cirrhosis. 
He develops a pneumothorax after the surgeons insert a central venous catheter. How do you know that he has had a pneumothorax? The signs and symptoms of a pneumothorax. Bob will complain that it hurts to breathe. He will complain that he feels like he's just not getting enough air. When listening to his lungs, one side will sound as if no air is moving through. Eventually, he will be breathing faster and his heart will beat faster. An ABG will show hypoxemia. The condition is best confirmed with a chest x-ray. There will be pain on the affected side, and when listening with the stethoscope, you will hear more moving on one side than the other. And of course, his O2 sats will likely be low. An x-ray confirms the problem, and it is the best way to diagnose and determine the extent of the problem. The x-ray will show that a lung is not full and round. A pneumothorax requires evacuation of the air to restore negative pressure. A needle might be inserted, a thoracentesis. Usually a catheter must be inserted into the pleural space to drain the air, fluid, or blood. A device called an underwater seal drainage system is attached to the inserted catheter. Chest tubes are usually inserted under a local anesthetic. The skin over the area of the insertion is first cleansed with antiseptic solutions such as iodine before a sterile drape is placed around the area. The local anesthetic is injected into the skin and down to the muscle. And after the area is numb, a small incision is made into the skin and a passage made through the skin and muscle into the chest. The tube is placed through this passage, if necessary. Patients may be given additional analgesics for the procedure. Once the tube is in place, it is sutured to the skin to prevent it from falling out and a dressing is applied to the area. The tube stays in for as long as there is air or fluid to be removed or risk of more air gathering. Once the drain is in place, an x-ray will be taken to check the location of the drain. Bob Buser has a tension pneumothorax which is exhibited by extreme dyspnea and tracheal deviation to the unaffected side. When air is allowed to build, the opposite chest gets compressed and you can actually see the trachea being pushed to the opposite side by the air buildup. Bob Buser needs immediate treatment for the tension pneumothorax. There has to be a way for the air to escape. An immediate thoracentesis will be performed, followed by a chest tube catheter insertion. The catheter will be attached to an underwater seal drainage system, or chest tubes, which has three compartments, one to collect fluid, one to collect air, and one to use for suction, which increases the pull of fluid and air out of the pleural space. A common trade name for this system is the Plurivac. When a patient has a pneumothorax, a catheter is inserted high up into the chest since air rises. If the patient has fluid or blood collecting, the catheter will be placed towards the bottom of the ribcage since fluid goes to the bottom. Some patients have both air and fluid, so they will have two catheters placed and the two catheters will be attached together and connected to the drainage system. The newest type of underwater drainage systems use dry suction. You simply turn the dial to the amount of suction you want. A Heimlich valve, also called a flutter valve, can be attached to the chest catheter to drain air. It has a one-way valve so the air can come out but can't get back in. However, it really cannot drain fluid because the fluid would have nowhere to go. While managing drainage systems, ensure that the dressing on the chest around the tube is tight and intact. Depending on the agency policy and the surgeon's preference, reinforce or change loose dressings. Assess the patient for difficulty in breathing. Assess breathing effectiveness by pulse oximetry. Listen for breath sounds in each lung. Check the alignment of the trachea. Check the tube insertion site for condition of the skin and palpate the area for puffiness or crackling, which may indicate subcutaneous emphysema. Observe the site for signs of infectious, redness, purulent drainage, or excessive bleeding. Check to see if the tube eyelets are visible. Assess for pain, its location and intensity, and administer drugs for pain as prescribed. 
assist the patient with deep breathing exercises, coughing, and perform maximal sustained inhalations using an incentive spirometer. And of course, reposition the patient who reports a burning pain in the chest. Drainage systems. First, do not strip the tube. Keep drainage systems lower than the level of the patient's chest. Keep the chest tube as straight as possible and avoid kinks or dependent loops. Ensure the test tube is securely taped to the connector and that the connector is taped to the tubing going into the collection chamber. Assess bubbling in the water seal chamber, which should be gentle bubbling on a patient's exhalation, forceful cough, or position changes. Assess for titling. Check the water level in the water seal chamber and keep the level at that recommended by the manufacturer. Check the water level in the suction control chamber and keep the level prescribed by the surgeon. Clamp the chest tube only for brief periods to change the drainage system or when checking for air leaks. Check and document the amount, color, and characteristics of fluid in the collection chamber as often as needed according to the patient's condition and agency policy. Empty collection chamber or change the system before the drainage makes contact with the bottom of the tube. When a sample of drainage is needed for culture or other laboratory test, obtain it from the chest tube after cleansing the chest tube and use a 20 gauge or smaller needle and draw the specimen into a syringe. Immediately notify the physician or your rapid response team for tracheal deviation, a sudden onset or increased intensity of dyspnea, an oxygen saturation of less than 90%, drainage greater than 70 ml per hour, visible eyelets on the chest tube, the chest tube falls out of the patient's chest, but first cover the area with a dry sterile gauze, chest tube disconnects from the drainage system. First, put the end of the tube in a container of sterile water and keep it below the level of the patient's chest. Our drainage in the tube stops in the first 24 hours.